I am going to start with the boring housekeeping just because, you know, we need to do boring housekeeping. So you have all sat down. That was the first thing on my list. The next thing is, could you please pull out your phone and confirm that it is either off or on silent or on flight mode, whatever you need to do to ensure that our brilliant speakers today who've worked so hard to prepare an amazing three-minute pitch for you are not going to be put off by having someone's phone ring in the middle. I think that would be very sad. So let's make sure that doesn't happen. I also need to let you know that in the unlikely event of an emergency, our event staff, who is not me, um, somebody will tell us uh, where we need to go. So we do have wonderful event staff here from Melbourne Connect. They will let us know what we need to do. Um, please be aware that there are two exits from this room. In the case of an emergency, you are welcome to use both. One directly that way and one that way. But unless it's an emergency, please only use that exit. Um, that's the one that we want people to use so that we have the least disruption possible for our speakers. We are going to have a break in the middle of our talks today. So if you are desperate for the loo, if you can possibly hold on, we will have a break between the speakers. Just so again, we have as little disruption as possible. All right. So... The University of Melbourne acknowledges the traditional owners of the unceded lands on which we work and live and learn. And of course, Indigenous Australians have been custodians of the Australian continent and waterways for many, many thousands of years. I acknowledge and respect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as our first researchers and our first storytellers. I pay my respect to Elders past and present and welcome all First Nations people joining us today in person or on our live stream. I'm Jen Martin. I'm an Associate Professor here at the University in the Faculty of Science. I lead the Science Communication Teaching Program and I also have the great honour of being part of the RDU team. What is the RDU? The RDU is the Research and Development Unit. Oh, and it's all up there. So we have the great pleasure of running the University of Melbourne three minute thesis competition. And really the RDU is a resource for all of the researchers at the University of Melbourne. We wanna provide opportunities for development so that all of our researchers have the opportunity to thrive, to get access to the information and training that they need. And we're interested in supporting our researchers to have an impact to do work that is going to lead to positive change in the world. And if you'd like to find out more about RDU events, please have a look at rduevents.unimelb.edu.au. I think that's the plug I need to give. Is that right, Kat? Whew. Kat, who you're about to meet, is the director of the RDU. And if I got the plug wrong, I would be in big trouble. No, just kidding. So we are here to celebrate the three-minute thesis. Uh, a competition many of you will be very familiar with, or perhaps it's your first time. Maybe we should have a show of hands. Who's never been to a 3MT competition before? Woohoo! Welcome! Oh my gosh, look at that! I think you all need a cheer. Woohoo! The 3MT, I believe, as a person who's very invested in research communication, I think is a really fabulous, fabulous competition. It began at the University of Queensland back in 2008 and now exists in more than 85 countries. I had a question just before, how long has it been at the University of Melbourne? And I couldn't find out. <laughs> if anyone knows the first year that we celebrated the 3MT at the University of Melbourne, please let me know. But my favourite thing about the 3MT is how it began. So picture Queensland. Oh, what year was the first winner? That would make sense, 2010. So we were actually pretty quick adopters then because 2008 is where it began. So the story is that 2008, Brisbane, Queensland has been in drought for quite a long time and the Queensland government in an effort to try and get people to save water asked people to limit their showers to three minutes. And in an effort to do that, sent every single person one of those cute little egg timers with a suction cap on it that they could put in their shower to time their shower. And uh, Emeritus Professor Alan Lawson, who at the time was the Dean of the Graduate School at UQ, the story goes, rather than singing in the shower, was pondering research communication and came up this, with this idea, well, if I can get clean in three minutes, surely a graduate researcher could explain their research in three minutes. 
And that is how the competition uh, began. And as I said, it's now celebrated in more than 85 countries around the world. So the 3MT is about challenging PhD researchers to present their research in accessible language to an intelligent, that's you guys, intelligent but non-specialist audience. And they only get three minutes and they're only allowed to have one slide, which is quite different to how academics are generally trained to communicate. We generally have a lot longer and we often have a lot of slides. So this is something very different. We have 14 amazing finalists with us today. Each of them has uh, fought hard to win their place in today's grand, grand final. They've all competed in faculty and central heats to be here today. So we have some extraordinarily high quality uh, research communication for your ears and eyes. So these are the competition rules. I won't go through them all. Essentially what it says is one slide. It has to be static. No videos, no animation, nothing like that. No props, no tap dancing, no interpretive dance, no, you know, nothing like that. It is really our graduate researchers and their words. Um, yeah, three minutes and they cannot go over three minutes. So we always say you are better to stop in the middle of a sentence than to finish your sentence and go over time because that's the difference between a half-spoken sentence and being disqualified and we don't want anyone to be disqualified. There are judging criteria. Again, I'm not going to read through them all. You can see they are divided into two groups. Essentially, the first half is around content and the second half is around presentation skills. And so these are uh, criteria that all of our grand finalists are very familiar with. We have some wonderful prizes today. So the winner not only <laughs> will walk away with $5,000, <laughs> maybe we can tell we're all in a cost of living crisis right now, <laughs> but you know, $5,000, that is no small amount of money. $5,000 and not just that, but the great honour and excitement of representing the University of Melbourne uh, in the Asia Pacific 3MT big competition. So that is an honour indeed. We do have prizes for the runner-up and you, our highly intelligent, wonderful audience, will also be getting to vote for our People's Choice Award. So please keep your ears out because I'm going to let you know when that voting uh, opens and you'll, you'll only have kind of 10, 15 minutes to do that. So please don't miss your chance to cast your vote. But uh, the difficult part of today, I believe, falls on these four wonderful people over here because what you are going to find is that all of these talks are really fabulous and you're going to find it hard to decide which one should win. They have to decide. It's the, it's the judge's job to come up with the winner and the runner-up. So let me introduce you to our fabulous judges. Professor Kat McFerrin is an international expert on the topic of music and music therapy and adolescence. She's the head of the Creative Arts Therapies Research Unit and as I said before, the director of the Researcher Development Unit. And it's my great pleasure to work with Kat uh, on the RDU portfolio, is that the right word? That'll do, sounds very fancy anyway. So Kat is the head of our judging panel today. Welcome everybody, please come in. The second judge I would like to introduce you to is Dr Angelina Fong. And Angelina is a renowned educator. She's currently a senior lecturer in anatomy and physiology. And she's excited about sharing her passion for science and inspiring the next generation of scientists. Her research work extends from newborn marsupials to rattlesnakes to humans. Not sure what those three things have in common. And her current role as an education uh, education-focused academic has her sharing her passion for science and effective science communication with our fabulous students. Welcome Angelina, we're very pleased to have you. Our third judge today is Cade Huckstep, who is a PhD researcher in the field of addiction neuroscience, focused on exploring neural mechanisms of alcohol use disorder. Their research aims to identify novel treatments which offer hope for individuals facing alcohol-related challenges. And Cade was our 3MT grand final winner last year. 
and represented the university at the Asia Pacific competition, advancing both through the semi final and final rounds. Congratulations again, Cade. You're a star. <laughs> and we're very pleased to have you here as one of our judges today. Thank you. Our final judge today is Dr. Lyndon Ashcroft, who is Australia's only lecturer in climate science and science communication. And I'm very biased because she's a member of my team and she's fabulous. Lyndon's career has spanned the academic, not-for-profit and government sectors, including a stint at the Bureau of Meteorology. So you may have seen her uh, on TV talking about weather and climate. And she's won lots and lots of awards for her research and her outreach work in climate change, including she was uh, awarded a 2021 Victorian Tall Poppy Award and the 2020 Outreach Award from the Australian Meteorologic I've got to say it, Meteorological and Oceanographic Society. Oh my God. <laughs> Thanks for that, Lyndon. <laughs> all right, you have heard plenty from me. That is enough of me telling you all of those things, but I'm so thrilled. Our judging panel is really extraordinary today. They have a very hard job ahead of them. But it is time for you to start hearing from our incredible speakers. So let's get down to business. Our first speaker is Evelyn from the School of Chemistry in the Faculty of Science. It's my pleasure to welcome her to the stage. Evelyn is in the third year of her PhD and is trying to understand how the tuberculosis bacteria survives in our bodies. Now, before she started her PhD, Evelyn actually used to make paint for a living. So her suggestion is that next time you look at your beautiful feature wall, think of Evelyn, because she used to do that. <laughs> All right, Evelyn. The time is yours, please. Take the stage. Pandemic. Such an awfully familiar word, isn't it? After everything we've been through with COVID-19, we all know what it's like to live life alongside a pandemic. But what if I told you that there is another pandemic that has been around longer than COVID-19? Tuberculosis is also a lung disease and has been widespread for hundreds of years. Yet today, it is still taking the lives of over 1 million people every year. Now, I know what you're thinking. Australia doesn't have tuberculosis. Well, Australia is not considered one of the countries with high rates of tuberculosis incidence, but we are not safe from its grasp either. We have high migration rates from countries that do, and we also have a duty to the world to commit our resources to curing one of the oldest diseases in the history of humankind. The current treatment for tuberculosis involves taking four different antibiotics over a course of six months. That is quite a difficult regime to follow. And what's even worse is that there have been more and more cases of antibiotic resistance, showing us that our current treatment is becoming less and less effective at treating tuberculosis. So this shows us we really need to find better ways to do this. My research focuses on understanding the metabolism of the tuberculosis bacteria as a new way of killing it. Now, if you thought about your last meal when I said the word metabolism, then you are on the right track. Metabolism involves um, a series of specific steps to convert the food we eat into energy or nutrients that our bodies need to survive. The tuberculosis bacteria also need these steps to help them survive in our bodies. In particular, I found a junction point in the metabolism of the tuberculosis bacteria. If you try to mess with the balance of this junction, the bacteria fails to grow. I also found that the bacteria uses simple compounds generated during its metabolism um, as a way to regulate the junction and that it can use these compounds as an indicator of what is available to them so that they can change the junction according to their needs. Metabolism is such a huge part to the bacteria. So by targeting this important junction, maybe we can end this pandemic once and for all. Thank you. How good was that? So Evelyn uh, won our Faculty of Science local three-minute com uh, three thesis competition. 
And I think you get a sense of why. That was excellent. And uh, my biggest takeaway from uh, listening to everyone's talk was just feeling kind of ashamed that I had no idea how serious tuberculosis was and what a massive problem it is in all sorts of parts of the world and how kind of easy it is for us to be, for at least me personally, I'm not making any claims about any of you, but to be a bit ignorant about some of these things that we're so fortunate and privileged not to have to manage nearly as um, acutely, I guess, in Australia. So thank you, Evelyn, for sharing your work with us. And Evelyn was delighted to get to go first today because now you get to sit back and relax. <laughs> Well, everyone else here has to just bide their time. Thumbs up already. You guys, so good. Thank you, judges. Time to welcome then our second speaker to the stage, Amerton, who is a third-year PhD researcher from the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology. And Amerton's research focuses on underground hydrogen storage, which I'm really looking forward to hearing more about. And Amerton also tells me that he will go to any length to watch a soccer game featuring Manchester United, but that that often leads to heartbreak. <laughs> Please take the stage. Why whale boats are either the villains or the supporting structures, but never the heroes? In order to answer this, first we need to understand what is a whale bowl. A simple analogy to visualize a whale bowl is that you're drinking your favorite beverage out of its container using a straw. But here, the beverage is either the petroleum oil and gas or hydrogen, and the container is the porous, sponge-like reservoir rock, such as sandstone, which is typically found in Earth's crust. And the straw is the whale bowl, and the person who is drinking is industries like oil and gas production companies. So the whalebows can also be used to inject materials deep underground and store them, such as hazardous nuclear waste or carbon dioxide indefinitely, and petroleum, oil and gas, or hydrogen across different seasons. So how do these structures actually become the villains? Whalebows are very fragile and sensitive structures, which are made out of cement and steel. And these materials can easily be damaged by earthquakes, mismanagement, or the subsurface environment becoming toxic to them over time. So when a whale bow fails, it leads to blowout, a situation very similar to us trying to open a Coca-Cola bottle immediately after vigorously shaking it. <laughs> we all know what happens next. But when it is hydrogen or the petroleum oil and gas instead of Coca-Cola, it can lead to very serious catastrophic incidents. And one such accident occurred back in 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico, and it led to an irreversible marine and ecological damage or an area of 149,000 square kilometers. They even made a movie out of this incident with the title, The Deep Border Horizon. So what I am trying to do with my thesis is actually trying to prevent such movies from future production. <laughs> so my thesis has an overall aim of developing a whale bow with a longer life for underground hydrogen storage. Whirl has already started to move on from fossil fuels to its greener alternative hydrogen, but not from its container or the straw. The reservoir rocks and the whale bows are still very much needed to store large quantities of hydrogen deep underground, as hydrogen possesses the risk of becoming an explosive if stored above ground. I have performed range of experimental series and figured out that the existing whale bow cement, which is widely used across the petroleum, oil, and whale industry, is not suitable for hydrogen, as it lets hydrogen flow through it, and it's not durable for hydrogen-related environments. The good news is I have also figured out the way on improving the existing whalebow cement to be able to use for underground hydrogen storage with the help of several additives. Whalebows may never become the heroes, but my study can always prevent them from becoming the villains. Thank you. Thank you, Amerton. That was fantastic. I'm just trying to think if I've ever heard somebody describe one of the goals of their PhD before to be to not have a particular kind of movie made. <laughs> Thinking that probably doesn't happen very often. The other thing I just loved about that was we sometimes find in the world of STEM that, you know, if you've got something 
that you're trying to explain that's very complex and it's a really great idea to come up with an analogy. But sometimes the analogies are so complex in and of themselves that they don't necessarily help. But, you know, shaking up a bottle of Coke and having it go everywhere and what that looks like and having a straw going down into my cup, I, I get those things. So that was excellent. Thank you very much. We are good to go. Our brilliant judges, thank you. So next, I am thrilled to welcome Helena to the stage. Helena has just finished the first year of her PhD in the Faculty of Business and Economics. And her research takes a multidisciplinary focus on decision making and integrating insights from economics and personality psychology to explore how personality can be used as a signal. The other thing I want you to know about Helena is that she tells me, much to her great alarm, that she has just recently transformed from being a night owl to being a morning lark. She's been waking up at 6 a.m. before her alarm goes off. She's actually doing her best to return to her former sleep schedule and is very, well, uh, very keen to have any advice from anyone <laughs> about how to stop waking up so early. But we're very glad you're awake now, Helena. Thank you. So, what if I told you your personality can speak louder than words, gently shaping your every interaction? Personality isn't just a set of traits, it's something we express in every situation. For example, like extroversion is how outgoing you are, but your extroversion changes depending on if you're quietly reading a book or if you're talking in front of, in front of a group of people. For my speakers, that might be a very real example. Um, for the other researchers in the room, I ask you to think about how you chose your supervisor. You might have looked for expertise and research skills, but in addition, you probably wanted to find someone who fits. Why is that? Well, because personality predicts important outcomes like work success and relationship quality. In addition, we as people are really good at reading personality from behaviors and first impressions. So, looking on the left, in my example of choosing your supervisor, you might have looked out for signs of agreeableness as that predicts cooperation and empathy. And a supervisor who's low on agreeableness, who really wants to work with you, might actually want to be or show higher levels of agreeableness to match what you're seeking. But research in personality has often separately studied how people see and show their personality. So my research brings these two perspectives and models personality as a signal. I look at how people choose to signal their personality and how others respond. But in real life, like when you're choosing a supervisor, there's a lot of factors at play. So it's really hard to tell exactly what causes what. So I designed a controlled experiment in which I can isolate what factors cause people to signal their personality. And looking on the right, we can, um, I find that context really matters. People are willing to pay up to 20 times more to signal higher levels of agreeableness in scenarios that promote trust compared to scenarios that don't promote trust. And these signals really change how people respond. In these trust scenarios, the people invest more in their partners when they see signs of agreeableness compared to signs of extroversion. So in summary, our personality um, can signal who we are and who we want to be and shape our everyday interactions. Thank you. That was wonderful, Helena. I'm guessing that you get uh, a lot of people asking you questions <laughs> about your research. My experience from many, many years of picking topics that I can uh, talk about on breakfast radio, science topics that I can talk about on breakfast radio, people love studies about personality, how our personalities predict all sorts of things, how our personalities change over time, 
what we need to do in, you know, those terrible group job interview situations to try and convince people of our personalities, all of those things. People love that stuff. So um, there will be time later with refreshments available after all of our speakers, and I'm sure Helena will be happy to answer questions. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm very excited to welcome our fourth speaker to the stage, who is Sarah, a fourth year PhD candidate in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, who is looking at incorporating 3D printed porous structures into titanium hip replacements. And outside of her studies, Sarah helps people find balance mentally and physically as a yoga instructor. Thank you so much, Sarah. Question. Why do we make hip implants solid when the bone is spongy? It's worth asking. Think of how incredibly cool and important our largest joint is. From sitting down just now or walking to the office this morning, consider all the things our hips allow us to do. But this is not true for about 50,000 Australians per year. 50,000 Australians who require a new hip to be able to do all these things pain-free. So what do we do to help them? We replace their hip with a solid titanium implant. And they work, but they leave the bone unhappy. Why? Well, titanium is stiff a lot stiffer than bone. It absorbs most of the load our bones are designed to withstand, leaving the hips underused. So what? Well, bone is alive, it wants to be used. If we don't use it, we lose it. For these patients, this is exactly what happens. Over time, the bone starts to disappear, the implant loosens, and we need to replace it again. Another surgery, another rehab. But what if we could make the implant and the bone share the load? Encourage the bone cells to grow and connect with the implant. Make the implant part of the body. Maybe we can. The secret lies in the internal structure of bone, the spongy part that makes bone so light but at the same time rigid and strong. Porosity. Now imagine we could mimic this with titanium, making it more like bone. But not just like any bone, but like your bone. Take a CT scan, analyze your bone structure, run a few simulations and give you exactly the implant you need. This is what a little bit of math, some code and 3D printing allow me to do. What I'm doing in my PhD is find the design, the porous design that best recreates the state of a healthy bone before surgery. To create body friendly implants that encourage the bone to grow and connect rather than disappear. Now, Imagine you're one of the 50,000 Australians needing a new hip. In the past, you would get sad, disappearing bone. In the future, you will get a quick photo of your hip, the most optimal implant for you, and happy bone. So why did we make hip implants solid when the bone is spongy? Because we didn't have the right alternatives. But now, thanks to technologies like 3D printing, we can create porous, bone-friendly hip implants that are personalised for you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I have to say one of my very, very favourite things about the Three Minute Thesis competition is that I learn all sorts of extraordinary things I didn't know otherwise. Who, put your hand up. Have you ever thought about the fact before that our bones are spongy but things like hip replacement bits aren't? Who's thought about that before? No one. So it's not, oh, someone, one person up the back. <laughs> Are you her supervisor? <laughs> <laughs> ah, there you go. If you didn't hear that, the answer was I did a high school project on osteoporosis and that came up. But it seems so obvious, right? Like, of course, we want these replacement parts of our joints to mimic our bones. I just, I just think that's fantastic. I'd never thought about it before. Thank you for opening my mind. Wonderful. Now it is time to welcome Sabrina to the stage, a PhD candidate in her third year who is exploring the role of music listening on human emotions. And Sabrina has grown to master many skills outside of study while entertaining her young family, 
She tells me that her favourite is swiftly switching from nursery rhymes to J.S. Ondara tunes during family jams in her lounge room. Sounds like fun to me. Is anyone else invited? <laughs> awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina. Over to you. What is something that you can spend up to 20 hours a week engaging with? Now, there's something it understands you, sometimes better than anyone else. It's that thing that we turn to when words fail. It can lift us up when we're feeling down and it can help us to process difficult emotions. I'm talking about music. You know that song that you play on repeat when you need to feel understood and you find yourself belting out every word as if that song was written just for you? How often do we hear someone declare, hey, that's my song, music. It can help us to feel almost any emotion we experience as humans. But have you ever considered how listening to music might influence the way you treat yourself? You see, my research, it explores this by examining how music can help us ease and acknowledge our own suffering, a concept that is known as self-compassion. You see, over the past few decades, researchers, they've been exploring this concept of self-compassion and its potential benefits for our mental and our emotional well-being. You see, self-compassion, it's all about treating ourselves with that same love, care, warmth and understanding that would quite easily go and offer to a friend who was going through a tough time. However, when we face hardships, we very rarely extend ourselves that same grace. But what if listening to music could help us bridge that gap? My study through an online survey of 296 people found that 82% experienced self-compassion when they listen to music. One participant shared how when they listen to a certain song, it helps them to understand that other people have faced similar struggles to them, helping them to feel less alone and less isolated. Another person shared how they use music to intensify emotional discomfort so that they can go and vent completely. Then once their emotions were off their chest, they were able to open themselves up to kindness and compassion. Now, my next study aims to extend from online surveys to in-depth, in-person interviews to further explore this relationship between music listening and self-compassion. As mental health and well-being concerns continue to rise, this need for accessible self-care tools is becoming increasingly important. Finding that music, a simple everyday activity, can be a pathway to self-compassion can lead to so many opportunities because these insights can lead to new mental health strategies using music. Music, as we know, is so much more than just entertainment. It can be a pathway for emotional growth and for self-compassion. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. That was amazing. It makes me wonder, I remember a few years ago a study coming out that uh, recorded the fact that doctors had started prescribing time in nature as, you know, as medicine. And I'm just wondering how long it will take before we see doctors prescribing listening to music as a really important health, you know, health intervention because your study is clearly showing how, Im how impactful it is. If you are thinking how difficult it is for these incredible graduate researchers to tell us about their research in three minutes, I need to tell you that Sabrina this year also took part in our Visualise Your Thesis competition, which is where you only get one minute. You have to make a video, so it's, it's uh, visual communication in one minute, uh, and Sabrina smashed it and won our Visualise Your Thesis competition this year. So if you want to hear that in one minute, you can go on to, I can't remember what the website is, but it's there. Look up Visualise Your Thesis, University of Melbourne, Sabrina. So thank you, Sabrina. Wonderful. Yes, give Sabrina a clap. I agree. Okay, we are up to speaker number six. So, I am delighted to welcome Ash to the stage. Ash is a second year PhD researcher from the School of Biosciences in the Faculty of Science. And Ash's research is trying to find if novel infections of bacteria alter a pest's tolerance to chemicals or biologicals. So essentially her research is helping provide sustainable solutions for pest control, something that we all know is very important. 
Now, when Ash is not in the lab, she likes to indulge in Melbourne's cafe culture, despite the heavy toll that it takes on her bank account. She tells me that she's also an avid fan of solo travel who is always looking forward to her next adventure. I wonder where you could go with $5,000. Hmm. Come take your place on the stage, Ash. Have you ever seen these nasty critters ruining your garden? Sucking the life out of your hard-grown fruits, veggies, or roses? These little terrors are called aphids, a type of insect that like to feed on plants. If you find them annoying, can you imagine the magnitude of problems that they cause for farmers? Aphids, particularly the green peach aphid, as pictured here, is a huge agricultural pest in Australia. Year in and year out, they cost farmers $100 million due to the damage they cause to crops. Outbreaks of this pest are handled with harmful chemical pesticides. And unfortunately, due to the use of these ke chemicals over decades, this pest has developed resistance to the chemicals. So modern agriculture is trying to move away from these chemicals in favor of more eco-friendly and sustainable biological control options. Our lab is contributing to this research in alternative biological control. And we have found a weapon. No, it's not a gun. It's not a bomb. It's a bacteria called Rickettsiella. Rickettsiella is a naturally occurring bacteria found in other aphid species. But in our lab, we are taking Rickettsiella and we are injecting it into the problematic green peach aphid to see if it negatively impacts this pest. A key result of my work shows that when the pesticide-resistant green peach aphid is infected with Rickettsiella, it is more sensitive to fungal pathogens. Death by fungus in itself is a clean, clear, non-chemical pathway towards pest control. But what my work is also showing is that when it is infected with Rickettsiella, the fungal pathogens are more effective. That's an amazing two-for-one outcome. So my work is paving the way towards releasing our weapon, Rickettsiella, in the field. But a more important outcome of this research shows that we can combine different biological control agents to have a more effective outcome, such as combining beneficial insects and fungicides. So the next time you see this pesky aphid in your garden, don't worry. Just remember that we're arming our green warriors with the ultimate bacterial weapon to end the war with this pest. Thank you. Well done, Ash. Ash and I have had some fabulous conversations over the last couple of months about her really interesting work and obviously how important pest control is. And one of the things I love doing in the Faculty of Science is working with some of our uh, 3MT speakers and just brainstorming, you know, how are you going to tell this story? And uh, Ash and I had some great conversations about how most people interact with aphids. We decided roses, didn't we? Most people, that's, who you, that's where you come across aphids, aphids on your roses. So uh, yeah, I've very much enjoyed learning more about aphids. Thank you, Ash. Brilliant job. So we have one more speaker before we will be taking a short break. Our final speaker before the break is uh, Michael from the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. Michael's halfway through the second year of his PhD, researching architectural acoustics. I'm really already very excited. And its integration within architectural design. Now, you can gather, right, that I asked all of our speakers to tell me something interesting about themselves. So I wasn't just reading boring bios to you. And Michael's, I have to say, whew, listen to this. Michael tells me that he got to model for an ad that aired during the NBA playoffs. The second part of the sentence was that that model was a scale architectural model for the set design. <laughs> 
But he says he sometimes likes to leave off that detail because it just leaves everyone a bit confused about, you know, is he really a model? How cool. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate your creativity. Over to you. Now, when I say the words architectural acoustics, the first thing that springs to mind are the grand concert halls, the Sydney Opera House, the Berlin Philharmonie, the Boston Symphony Hall. And while these buildings represent the epitome of acoustic performance, concert halls aren't where the problem is. The problem is open plan offices where one person speaking breaks everyone's attention. The problem is noise build up in classrooms affecting how students learn, especially those with learning difficulties. The problem is the post-COVID era of every single room being fitted with speakers and microphones, regardless of whether or not they were designed for it. Now, when an architect designs a concert hall, acoustics are the priority, and we call an acoustician from day one, but it's the acoustic non-priorities where the problems occur. But why do they occur? Well, an architect can go to a book on architectural acoustics, they'll flick to a page on office design, and there they'll find values for the reverberation time, a weighted decibels, noise transmission class, speech intelligence index, speech transmission index. Now, when I graduated from architecture school, I couldn't remember what any of those meant. <laughs> Which value would change if I moved a wall by a meter or changed the floor from carpet to tiles? The metrics that we use to teach and measure acoustics are separated from the things that they represent, sound. So in the same way, we use intuitive methods to teach structural design to architects by getting them to build models and seeing if they fall down. My research looks for intuitive ways to teach acoustics. So for example, we know that sound propagates in a very similar way to light, and we have examples of great architects who have used this analogy with scale models and drawings to see how sound reflects in a space. Since architecture works visually, can we tap into the visualization of sound propagation and combine it with modern simulation tools to teach acoustics? Or another example, we all know that singing in the shower sounds very different to singing in the library. <laughs> Even without doing it, right? And we know this because we have decades of compounded experiences of sound in spaces. How can we tap into these sound memories and our innate ability to subjectively perceive and judge acoustic qualities to guide decision making. Through a series of action research based workshops, my research will develop, test and compare these kinds of novel approaches to find the best ways for architects to learn and apply acoustic design. The outcomes of my research will affect curriculum and pedagogy design, improving acoustic literacy and knowledge for future architects. This improved knowledge will in turn improve indoor environmental quality, acoustic comfort and well-being for future buildings and their occupants. Thank you. Okay, Michael, I have to ask you, have you sung in a library? <laughs> <laughs> you have? I've got 24 years of experience with classical violinists. <gasps> oh. Now we're all thinking, ooh. -hoo. The classical violinist becomes a, an architectural acoustician. Is that what you call yourself? I think I just made that word up, but he didn't, he didn't tell me it was wrong. So could you please join me in really a huge round of applause for our first seven speakers? I'm really very, very proud of all of you. I think that was just amazing. So what needs to happen now is that we are going to have a 10 minute break so that we can change over the lapel mics to our remaining seven speakers. If you need to go to the loo, I failed to tell you earlier, sorry. Basically, you just go out that door. Bron, wave at everybody. Pass Bron out that door, turn right, go through the really fancy lit up archway that's out there at the moment for Innovation Week and then a hard right. Um, but if you do need to go, please go straight away because we, we want to get started. Our remaining seven speakers don't want to sit around waiting for everybody to come back in. So we will begin again exactly at one o'clock. Do not be late. Our next speaker will be speaking at one o'clock. See you then. The speakers are champing at the bit to get their talks done. It's really hard to be in the second half and have to wait. So thank you to all of you. So I'm very pleased to uh, get the ball rolling again to invite Harry who is here from the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences. Harry's in the second year of his PhD and wants to make an AI tool that can automatically classify behaviours based on videos of mice 
without needing a human to sit there and watch all of those videos. So this involves learning about machine learning and the many challenges faced by mental health researchers. The other essential thing you need to know about Harry is that he likes chocolate bars, but not chocolate ice cream, hot chocolates or chocolate milkshakes. <laughs> Harry, I don't know if we can be friends, <laughs> but I'm very much looking forward to hearing your 3MT. Thank you. Imagine spending over a hundred hours watching videos of mice like this. I have done this and it is boring. <laughs> In mental health research, researchers regularly test experimental drugs for treating human mental health disorders in animals such as mice. By recording mice and manually scoring behaviours before and after drug administration, the impacts of a drug can be found. For example, by manually scoring scratching and shaking from videos of mice withdrawing from alcohol dependence, the impacts of a drug in reducing anxiety-like symptoms can be found. Unfortunately, this process is time-consuming and tedious. I have spent over 100 hours of my life manually scoring behaviours from videos of mice and I could only scratch the surface of the backlog of videos that would benefit from behavioural analysis. If we could automate this, we could understand how drugs influence mouse behaviour with unprecedented accuracy and detail. Not only that, we could save considerable research time within my lab and thousands of labs globally. Luckily, AI, or artificial intelligence, has enabled the development of automated behavioural classification methods based on videos of mice. They work by training one tool to track body part joint locations over time and another to convert these data into behavioural sequences. The second tool is fast and easy to use, but the first tool is slow and hard to use. In my PhD project, I want to create an AI tool that can track joint locations based on videos of mice out of the box. This would make the entire automated behavioural classification pipeline fast, easy to use and accessible. To do this, I will generate a data set of thousands of images of mice paired with body part locations and train an AI tool to predict joint locations based on these images. I will also create these images synthetically using computer modelling tools. I've already demonstrated that this AI tool can perform accurate joint tracking in videos of mice withdrawing from alcohol dependence, and I hope to replicate this in many more scenarios. This resource should make automated mouse behavioural classification fast and easy for all researchers. I also hope this will facilitate mental health research so that people living with mental illness have a future to be excited about. Well done, Harry. That was awesome. Last week, I had the great pleasure of having a chat with Harry and uh, thinking about this talk. And we kind of came up with this, yeah, this idea that there would be thousands and thousands and thousands of labs around the world that would benefit from this. And Harry was being very modest and wanting to say, you know, a couple of hundred labs. I'm like, no matter, I think it's a lot more than that. <laughs> Cade, who has a lot of experience in this area, is nodding feverishly. You know, this, um, this research is incredibly important. And yes, I'm very excited. So thank you for sharing your research with us, Harry. Our next speaker is Carol, who is a third year PhD candidate in management and marketing in the Faculty of Business and Economics. And she is passionate about consumers and their practices that often challenge market and societal norms. So her research focuses on consumer culture, sustainable consumption and market legitimacy. And when Carol first started diving into this area of sustainable fashion, she took up knitting, as one does. But 
she tells me it turns out that it's not the best hobby for a PhD researcher because although she saved money on scarves, she's ended up spending so much more on remedial massage for her poor <laughs> neck, back and shoulders. We're sorry to hear that, Carol. Please come to the stage. Have you ever wondered how many times you wear your clothes before throwing them away? The answer here might surprise you. On average, we throw away a piece of clothing after just seven wears. And every year, a typical Australian disposes around 23 kilograms of clothing into landfill, making textile waste one of our biggest waste problems here. While brands talk about sustainable fashion and ethical fashion, they're still producing more. And, you know, there are also several catches here. For example, when it comes to sustainable fashion, if we want to buy a piece of jeans from a sustainable denim brand, can, it can easily cost us over $300, making it seem like sustainable fashion is a privilege and only for a select few. And also, despite their claims, these brands are still producing more stuff and, you know, consuming more resources, bearing the fact that currently we have enough clothes on the planet that can close six generations. So, can we dare to imagine a different future here, where sustainable fashion doesn't really mean producing more and buying new, but instead, it's about making the most of what we already have. My thesis then looked into this group of consumers who have found their own solution, extending the lifespan of their wardrobe through what I call clothing preservation. I conducted 24 interviews and collected data across 15 workshops and online community in five cities in Australia and discovered that these individuals engage in 15 different practices when caring for the clothes, thrifting, mending, upcycling to extend the lifespan of their own clothing. While these practices may seem simple, but when you perform them together, they can be quite engaging and demanding. For instance, when washing clothes, this individual would pay close attention to how simple wearing and mending would impact the repaired area across time. And also discover that as people continue preserving their clothes, they are continue committed in learning and expanding their skills. Then, my research point to the importance of supporting clothing resale market and to encourage current fashion brands to provide better aftercare services and guidance, making sustainable fashion inclusive and accessible. I also highlight that reusing and repurposing new, new textile waste is more than just an eco-friendly practice. It can very much so become a viable industry as we witness consumers transform into clothing preservers. So the message here for all of us is everyone can participate in sustainable fashion without costing the earth. So start with something small today, like washing your clothes at the right temperature or learning a new skill like, you know, invisible mending. Together and collectively, we can extend the lifespan of our own wardrobe, reduce waste, and make sustainable fashion a reality for all. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. That was just fabulous. All sorts of things that I have not thought about nearly enough. Put your hand up if you reckon you wear your clothes more than seven times before you dispose of them. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Does that mean that we're wonderfully sustainable uh, fashion people or just that we're not fashionable at all <laughs> and we just wear really old clothes? <laughs> I think I wear clothes for many, many, many years. That was really interesting, Carol. And I have to say, I'm proud of my children for many reasons, but one of the things I'm very proud of is that I have a 13-year-old daughter who is really susceptible to kind of that peer pressure of fashion, but her favourite place to shop is the op shop. So I feel like I've definitely done something right having a 13-year-old who loves op shops. Okay, it is now my delight to welcome Mimi to the stage, a third year PhD researcher in the School of Geography, Earth and Atmospheric Sciences in the Faculty of Science. And Mimi's research investigates empowerment strategies for women who are seeking asylum in Australia. Her study uses participatory research methods in human geography to explore agency, the lived experience and how women navigate power dynamics while seeking safety in Australia. Mimi also tells me that she reckons if she continued to play soccer the way she did in primary school, she would now have an Olympic gold medal. 
very topical, Mimi. But sadly, she decided that snack breaks were more fun than practicing soccer. What a shame. Thank you, Mimi. I want you to imagine something for a moment. Imagine fleeing your home, leaving behind everything you know and love, your family, your friends, your career, because you are in danger. And then landing in a new country to seek safety and live as an asylum seeker. This was my reality when I first came to Australia. This photo is me when I first arrived in Melbourne. I look fine, don't I? But the truth is, I was alone, felt lost, and had to start building a new life from scratch. My circumstances have completely changed now and radically changed, but my story is not unique. Right now, thousands of women are living in our community waiting for a visa to call Australia home and their experiences have been largely overlooked. And this is where my research comes in, to really understand the lived experience of women seeking asylum, the, the challenges they face, and opportunities that are available to them. So how can we support women and make them feel safe? To do this, I first interviewed women and collected first-hand experiences to understand their everyday lives. Second, I asked women to take photographs of their everyday lives and share the meanings behind them. I really wanted to understand what matters for women when they are waiting for a visa, a protection visa to be determined. What I found out is often in the country, when women are waiting, they are feeling dismissed and they are ignored. But by finding ways to increase participation, inc inclusion, and also supporting them more, not only the feeling of safety is increased, but also women feel empowered in our communities. What I want and what I hope my research can do is for every woman who come to the country feeling like this, to feel like the way I feel now, to feel safe, belong, and be valued. Thank you. Well done, Mimi. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Again, because Mimi is in the Faculty of Science, I've had the pleasure of having some conversations with her about this talk and about her work. And we had a lot of conversations about this photo and the fact that someone can look safe and well and happy and supported. And we actually have no idea what's going on for them underneath. And it's been a great reminder for me just to think a little bit more about what can be happening for people in their lives that we have no, no visibility over. So Mimi, it's been such a pleasure to meet you and to, to learn more about your work. Thank you. We are up to speaker 11. We are racing through this, which means our remaining speakers are like, please, come on, can we get to me now? Amy, it is finally your turn. Amy is a music therapist who's in the final year of her PhD in the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music. And her research interest is working with children and families to support them to incorporate music as a positive resource into their lives. So this ranges from hospital and hospice work, schools and within community spaces. And she's particularly drawn to therapeutic songwriting because she loves how meaningful the process can be to support people to create an original song based on their own life experiences. Amy also loves traveling, probably not too uncommon to people in the room, but Amy is on a constant quest to find the best pan au chocolat in every country she visits. Uh, I'm happy to take advice on that, Amy. Thank you. Over to you.
Have you ever imagined what it is like to be a parent? Or if you are already, cast your mind back to before your child was born. You may have felt excited, joy, but maybe also a little apprehensive when you imagined what it might be like. Holding your baby lovingly, going for lattes and legging dates with friends, and watching them grow and develop each day. But now, I'd like you to imagine you're a parent who experiences a premature or a medically complex birth and then the need for a neonatal intensive care unit or a hospital admission. Many of those same feelings may still be there. However, now they may be intensified, fluctuate, or even be overwhelmed by the fear and the worry for your baby's overall well-being. Parents experience all of these feelings and they worry for their baby. And their own experiences can be complex and long-term, possibly impacting bonding and their own mental health. I'm a music therapist and I was really curious about how therapeutic songwriting, an approach whereby an original song or um, parody is created within the context of a therapeutic relationship, could be used to support parents after a hospital admission. My PhD research explored reflective songwriting, a new approach which I've articulated out of this research, and 12 parents engaged in engaging with music with their baby and sharing their memories. They reflected, they shared their feelings, kind of explored them and then together we shaped their songs. They chose which memories to include. We shaped the lyrics and the music to ensure that their song felt both meaningful and also emotionally contained to use with their baby. By using grounded theory, what I found was that parents used this opportunity to connect. They reconnected with themselves, they connected with their baby and for some they also connected with other people. When they shared their song, they felt like they'd been heard, they felt validated they felt like they'd been understood. And this was meaningful because they at times felt quite isolated. Parents over time it gained a sense um, of self-understanding and insight. And my project, I'm really hoping that it adds to the literature by giving a program where parents can make meaning and integrate their sense of self, thereby freeing themselves up to spend time with their baby and their future together. Now I'm not allowed to sing for you today. But I wanted to share just the opening lines of a couple of one of the parent songs. You're my little special girl. When you were born, you brightened up our world. Holding you for hours is what I could do for you. Thinking of you from home and wishing we could be there. You're our little special girl, our bubble girl. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. I'm guessing it wasn't just me who suddenly felt very emotional <laughs> hearing those words. Isn't it amazing, the power of those beautiful words? And I'm so sorry that you weren't allowed to sing, because had you been allowed to sing, I'm guessing it would have been even more powerful. I think we can all take away from today of all the wonderful things we've learned that maybe we need to pay more attention to the power of music in our lives from what we've heard today. Thank you, Amy. That was wonderful. We are ready to welcome Jing to the stage, who is a final year PhD candidate and research fellow in the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology. Her research interests include smart grids and the integration of electric vehicles. In her free time, Jing enjoys bouldering. She says it gives her repetitive failure, endless hurt, and a touch of depression, exactly like her PhD. <laughs> now, it makes her sound like a bit of a masochist, but Jing assures me that the more she fails, the more she achieves. And we're very much looking forward to seeing you achieve a wonderful talk today, Jing. Thank you. Look around, now there are so many Tesla on the road. But don't be surprised, if you could hop in a time machine and go back to 1890s, you would find even more electric vehicles running around. I'm not kidding, this new technology was actually invented before the petrol cars. It has taken us over 100 years to understand electric vehicles are better. They are quiet, smart, efficient, and most importantly, they can reduce the carbon emission and slow down the global warming. 
everything about electric vehicles just seems perfect. But charging them can be super challenging. You might imagine that you plug in your Tesla charger easily, like just how you charge your phone. Easy peasy, right? But this charging power can be massive. It is equivalent to charging thousands of phones simultaneously. And unfortunately, our power grid, which are the poles and the wires that deliver power to our homes, are not capable of this. When the power grid was designed decades ago, this massive charging power was not anticipated. And it can cause technical challenge very easily. For example, the wires can overheat and the voltage at your homes can be lower than needed. To address these challenges, my PhD mainly focused on three research questions. Question one, how many electric vehicles can the power grid to support? My study carried out stochastic assessment on different types of power grid. And it suggests for a dense urban power grid, it might only be support one in five houses with electric vehicle. Clearly, it's not good enough. So question two, what kind of solutions can we have to support more electric vehicles to be charged? You must have experienced very slow internet in a crowded event, because people need to share. What if we ask electric vehicles to share the charging in a similar way? Yes, the charging might be slower, but the car battery can still reach 100% over the night. To achieve this, my PhD proposes a smart control algorithm to schedule the electric vehicle charging. So we will have happy electric vehicles, also happy power grid. And question three, can we use the electric vehicle in a smarter way? Think about it like that. Your car is just a battery on four wheels. So my PhD also explores the use of vehicle to grid technology, which enables the car to be discharged. So it can power your home or even support the power grid. By answering all my research questions, we will make electric vehicles and the power grid work together. And ultimately, we will welcome more electric vehicles running on the road and leading us towards a brighter and a greener future. Thank you, Jing. Yet again, I discover how ignorant I am. <laughs> I thought the main barrier to us all driving electric vehicles was the cost of the vehicles. I had no idea that there was a problem of getting access to sufficient electricity for charging. So thank you for yet again helping me to realise how little I know. <laughs> but as I said, that's one of my very favourite things about the 3MT. Ooh, for the very first time, I haven't talked for long enough. You gather one of the things that this job involves is just kind of randomly talking about things while our judges do their job. And uh, sometimes I'm good at it and sometimes I'm not. So I just kind of keep surrepti surreptitiously looking over. And they're so good. Our judges are so fabulous today. We are up to our 13th, lucky 13th speaker. And... Our thirteenth speaker is Joel, who is a second-year PhD candidate in the Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences. And Joel is based at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in the Brain Cancer Research Lab. So Joel's investigating brain cancer in 3D and over the course of its development. Joel loves solo travel overseas where he often enjoys, he tells me, such activities as losing his phone in a lake and breaking his arm while riding a bike. <laughs> Do you just make sure you come up to the steps really carefully, please, Joel? <laughs> Over to you. Thank you. Would you be happy with this mark? Some people might consider you a perfectionist if not. But in some cases, 95% is definitely not good enough. Now, you may be happy for this to be a geography exam mark, but imagine instead you are a brain cancer patient who has just undergone surgery to remove most of your tumour, 95%. Now, this is great, and it is going to help improve your survival outcomes, but because of that 5% remaining, your cancer is eventually going to come back, typically more aggressive than before. And when 95% is also the proportion of brain cancer patients that succumb to their disease within five years of diagnosis, it's clear that we need to improve our treatment of brain cancer and that 95% isn't good enough here. So, 
why don't we just remove 100% of the tumour? Well, it's not so easy because this remaining 5% has infiltrated into the surrounding healthy brain tissue, which is vital for patients' normal daily functions, such as speaking or moving. We need to be able to target the cancer cells in these regions without causing damage to the surrounding healthy tissue. While previous studies have compared the healthy tissue next to the tumour, they haven't preserved the spatial context of these two, nor have they looked at the border region in the middle. If we can characterise this border region well, we may be able to target unique features of it and stop the tumour from spreading. And this is the goal of my PhD project, where I will be using new technologies called spatial omics that allow us to zoom in on this region and identify the location of individual cells and the genes inside them. Think of it like zooming in on Google Maps, where before, past studies have only been able to see the major highways. But now that I can zoom in, I start seeing all the smaller connecting roads and intersections that tell us the whole story. With some coding, this allows me to see how immune cells attack tumour cells, how these cells mix together at the border, and then what mechanisms the tumour uses to spread out into the healthy tissue. I can then target these mechanisms to stop the tumour in its tracks. Already, we have identified altered patterns of expression at these border regions. And though these patterns differ between different patients, we can start honing in on the signals shared across patients and target these to benefit as many patients as possible. So by zooming in on the spatial geography of brain cancer, my project is helping to improve patient outcomes by targeting the 5% of tumour left behind after surgery. By increasing tumour removal from 95% towards 100%, patients' brain cancers will be less likely to return. We need to improve our treatment of brain cancer, and I hope that my project will be getting us one step closer to achieving the top marks that patients truly deserve. Thank you. Nice one, Joel was excellent. It sounds like there's definitely an area that we all need to be absolute perfectionists in. And I think, you know, Joel's talk is a good reminder that many of these topics are things that, you know, our amazing graduate researchers have worked out how to talk about in a really engaging, uh, energetic, passionate way. But this is really important work. And I imagine many of you know someone who has had a brain cancer diagnosis and knows just how awful that is um, and how bad the prognosis can be. So behind the energy and the passion and, and all of the positivity, it's work that I'm just so glad that you're doing, Joel. Really interesting. Thank you. Oh, Rudika, we finally made it to you. It's so hard to wait and be the last speaker. And as you're about to hear, Rudika having to wait a very, very long time to be able to give her three-minute thesis talk is very fitting given the work that she is about to tell you about. Fritika is in the third year of her PhD in the School of Mathematics and Statistics in the Faculty of Science. And her specialisation is in using probability models to solve real world problems. What real world problem is she trying to solve, might you ask? Well, her PhD research is about improving call centres, call centre operations to minimise waiting times. How ironic then that we made you wait so, so, so long. Thank you for your patience. Now, Kritika tells me her superpower is being able to fall asleep in moving vehicles very, very quickly. She tells me that in a 12 hour flight, she gets 10 hours of solid sleep. Oh my gosh, I want your superpower. Please teach me how. But in the meantime, please come and take the stage. Please welcome our final speaker in our grand final. When was the last time you called a call center? And how many times did they tell you, please hold the line, your call is important to us? <laughs> My guess is you've heard this enough times that you don't believe it anymore. While I don't blame you, let me tell you a secret. Your call is actually important to the call centers. Well, at least in most cases, yes. So why are they taking so long to connect you to one of their agents. This is because taking staffing decisions in a call center can be really tricky. 
they have no information on how many calls they'll receive, at what time these calls will arrive, or how long it will take to serve them. So they rely on historical data to predict all these factors and then decide the number of agents they need. And when these predictions go wrong, that's when your wait time starts to increase. And this happens often, because us humans are unpredictable. We call them at random times and ask different queries. That's why, instead of focusing on perfecting these predictions, my PhD is about managing this inherent randomness. You see, in a call center, not all agents are the same. Some might be expert at solving sales queries, some at technical queries, and some can do both. The ways calls are assigned to an agent, known as the call allocation policy, can vary depending on these differences in the skills. That's why I created a mathematical model that considers important factors such as what is the rate that the calls are arriving, what is the rate at which calls are getting served, and other important factors to calculate the waiting time of the customers who will arrive in next few hours under different call allocation policies. I have been able to find the optimal policy so, so that the waiting time of the customers can be minimized by optimi optimally using the available staff. Now, I want to embed this into a software that can perform these calculations in real time and automatically allocate calls such that the wait time can be minimized. I really hope that my method gets adopted by call centers because I believe it has a potential to significantly improve their performance while keeping the cost down, ensuring that the next time you call, you really will feel like your call is important. Thank you. Thank you, Hritika, and thank you for being so patient. As I said, being the last speaker is very difficult. And I think all of us, not just you, hope that your work gets taken up by call centres so we can spend less of our time listening to those terrible messages and that awful elevator music. It drives me totally crazy. Okay, what needs to happen now is a huge clap for all of our speakers. I am so deeply proud of all of you. That was just phenomenal, seamless. Every single talk I thought was absolutely fabulous. And what I would like now to happen is for all of our speakers to give a massive clap to all of your supporters, all of the people who came to support you in the audience. <laughs> Woo! Okay, there'll be lots more clapping to come. What you can see has to happen now is that our esteemed judges have to go and do the very difficult thing that is deciding who our winner and our runner-up will be. Good luck, judges. We look forward to seeing you. I'm guessing they're going to take somewhere between maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Let's see how they go. In the meantime, you have a couple of jobs. The most important, please, is before you go anywhere else or do anything else is to cast your vote in the People's Choice Award. So please do that now. And then we will be back, I'm guessing, somewhere between around 10 and 15 minutes. It just depends as on how much 50 cups goes on in the, in the judging room. So if you need the bathroom, please do that. Uh, there's drinks. We will have refreshments coming later. So there will be delicious food to enjoy after the presentations of the prizes. But for now, there are definitely drinks to enjoy. But please just don't go too far away because our speakers obviously don't want to have to wait too long to find out the results. So we don't want to be having to call people in from a long way away. So just hang close, go to the bathroom, do what you need to do. And I will let you know when our judges are back. And thanks so much to all of you. Ooh, a hush fell over the room. As you've gathered, it was a really hard job for our judges. 
That took a while. Thank you for your patience. If you have another date at 2 o'clock, I'm really hoping you can be late by a few minutes for that date. There is also more food coming. Um, if you can stick around a little bit, we do, of course, want to make our announcements. Professor Kat McFerrin has briefly exited the room, potentially to write some certificates, I imagine. Oh, she's lost the piece of paper. <laughs> Excellent. So I'll just do a little bit of uh, ad-libbing them for a while. Aha, here she is. So, of course, I would like to very, very warmly thank our judges, Angelina and Cade and Lyndon and Kat. I reckon that was probably really, really difficult. I'm going to be very intrigued to hear about their conversations. But it is my great pleasure to hand over to Professor Kat McFerrin, Director of the RDU, to tell us a little bit about the judging process. Then I will announce the People's Choice Award and then Kat will announce the runner-up and the winner. Over to you, Kat. Well, I'd just like to begin by saying what is overly apparent to all of us here in the room, that that was an extraordinary suite of presentations and that you made our job very difficult. But this is not about us, but I'm just for a moment going to say thank you so much to the judges because that was a really difficult decision-making process and we were really excited uh, to be able to land on first a winner and then per somebody who comes as a runner-up. And we can't wait to hear about who the People's Choice Award is. The process that we used was obviously to use the assessment criteria, which you've all seen and everybody was prepping to. We represent different areas of knowledge. Some of us more expert in research communications. Some of us more expert in particular disciplinary fields. And we did feel that we represented the intellectual audience rather well not necessarily knowing the topics before we had to choose which ones were compelling. So there was definitely an emphasis on impact. And we know that research impact is the new emphasis within the university so that we don't forget to make sure that the research that we do does make a difference, a positive difference in the lives of other people. And so the impact of everything that we do here and all of the roles that we play uh, was particularly powerful in Ah, <laughs> all of them, really. <laughs> Similarly, aesthetics. You know, I come from the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music, so I do care about those slides. And there were some genius aesthetics used. Your performance strategies were marvellous. Using the stage, looking at people. I got so much eye contact during all of those presentations. Your use of voice was beautiful. So it was <laughs> lucky my time's not going down. I shouldn't talk <laughs> too long, should I? Okay, so anyway, it suffice to say we really enjoyed our time and it flew by and it was not easy to make decisions, but decisions have been made. <laughs> yes, decisions have been made. Thank you to everybody for voting in the People's Choice Award. Of course, as always, it was very close. It always is. But drum roll, please. It is my great pleasure to announce that the winner of the Unimelb 3MT Grand Final People's Choice Award for 2024 is Carol. <laughs> Woo! Come up, Carol. Now, I have no idea who the winners are. I cannot wait to find out. So back to you, Kat. Well, we also thought that Carol was fantastic. That was such a powerful description. And we loved the way that you landed solutions, that we really came away from your talk thinking, wow, OK, there are things that we can do. So thank you for that. And well deserved for the People's Choice Award. Congratulations. So should we start with the second, the runner up? Gosh, it's, it's like I kind of want to enjoy the moment and draw it out for you all. And I also want to end everything that's been happening for you. All right. Here we go. The runner-up for this year's 3MT is Sabrina McKenzie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. Sorry. Uh, Sabrina, Sabrina, just a moment. Sabrina, we wanted to comment. 
you know, there's, we're academics, <laughs> we love to comment. <laughs> we just wanted to say thank you for the way that you walked around the floor, that you engaged our attention, that you used your graphic really skillfully. We felt that we were all moved and touched by your compassion for us and that the way that you wove a narrative throughout the time was really powerful. So we really wish you well. I acknowledge that you are now the winner of two trophies <laughs> <laughs> and that we hope that bodes well for you making a difference in the world and that your impact and for me personally that I hope that music will be used as Jen mentioned for people's development and well-being. Thank you. So from self-compassion to weapons, mm, bacterial weapons in fact, our winner for the grand prize of this year's 3MT talked about bacterial weapons indeed, Ashrita Barai. <laughs> We really loved the way that you engaged us in our hearts and our minds to be really excited. You really, I could feel your care for your topic. I love the way you referenced your lab and then really defined exactly what it was that was your role that was going to make a difference in the world. It was both humble and yet so brilliantly stated that we all had faith that you would never overstate what it was that you were going to discover, but that what you discover could make a difference for everyone. So thank you. Well done. <laughs> but yeah, we could have pretty much gone anybody in some <laughs> way. Um, enormous, enormous congratulations to Carol and to Sabrina and to Ash. I'm delighted for all of you. I'm also just delighted for every single one of you. I understand how disappointing it is when you don't get to be the person coming up getting the flowers and the trophy, but you all just spoke magnificently. I hope you feel proud amidst the disappointment. I don't know that I've ever, I've been to a lot of 3MT competitions, a lot. I don't know that I've ever had a day before where every speaker I thought just nailed it. You are all so good. The passion, the clarity, the energy. No one stumbled. There wasn't a moment where my heart sank because I thought someone was about to get lost. It was just incredible. The, the, really, the quality was extraordinary. So please, could we have another round of applause for all of our speakers? <laughs> Woo! I think we can all be very proud to have witnessed today's really extraordinary grand final. I know you're hungry or you need to go and there's food, but I just have to do a few thank yous. So please, uh, I will just do claps at the end, okay? Let me list the people. To all of our speakers, obviously, to everyone who judged in the heats. You know, this is just the grand final. There's a lot that happens before we get to the grand final. So to everyone who was involved in the grand final, uh, to, sorry, to the heats, our judges today, Kat and Lyndon and Cade and Angelina, that was really hard. Thank you for your passion and your commitment to making those decisions. Um, to all of the guests, to everybody, whether you're a supervisor, a peer, a colleague, a friend, a family member, this is so much more fun with an audience. So thank you to all of you for coming and supporting the people that you care about and seeing them really shine on the stage. Huge thanks to the RDU team, especially Lucy, where's she gone, wherever Lucy is. She's doing something busy. Oh, she's up the back, of course, up the back, Lucy. And Andrew and Bron, who's been taking photos, Ruben, who's not here, but to the whole RDU team, led so beautifully by Kat, who really care about opportunities like this for research communication. So please stick around. There's more food. There's the opportunity to chat. Take lots of photos, I'm sure. Ask questions of our brilliant speakers. Um, Carol and Sabrina and Ash, you just do need to come up on the stage, please, so we can do some photos. But to everyone else, just warmest thanks for joining us today. Please tell everyone what an extraordinary event you witnessed today of our graduate researchers really doing something pretty special. So thank you for coming. <laughs>